After a series of devastating wildfires, California's largest utility, PG&E, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in January. PG&E estimates that its fire-related liabilities could ultimately exceed $30 billion, way more than its $1.4 billion insurance policy covers. It's rare for utilities to file for bankruptcy, but that could change soon. Extreme weather events are becoming more frequent and more costly. According to one estimate, natural disasters caused about $340 billion in damage across the world in 2017, and insurers had to pay out a record $138 billion. The insurance industry plays a huge role in the U.S. economy. Insurance spending in 2017 made up 11% of America's GDP. That means if the insurance industry is struggling, sooner or later, other sectors of the economy are going to start to feel it. So how will insurance companies remain profitable in an era of climate change? And what does that mean for the rest of us? The insurance industry is pretty straightforward. An insurer collects monthly premiums from policyholders and keeps it in a collective pool of money. They then tap into that money when they have to pay out a claim. Insurance companies make a profit by charging more money in premiums than they end up paying out in insurance claims. They're able to do this by measuring risk and estimating how much they can expect to pay out. Climate change is throwing off those risk estimates, and it's a problem for companies like PG&E and insurers alike. My name is Mike Kreidler. I'm the Washington State Insurance Commissioner, the longest serving insurance commissioner in the country. I'd have to tell you that what PG&E is doing right now with filing Chapter 11 a few years ago would have been just absolutely unheard of. I mean, these are bedrock companies. As insurance regulators, we put pressure on companies to make investments in very conservative financial instruments like PG&E because they're re re reliable and predictable. PG&E's bankruptcy might be drawing attention to the increase in risk from natural disasters, but that doesn't mean this is a new concern. It's as early as the late 1980s, really, that we started to see a concern amongst insurance companies that the risk environment that they historically were used to is changing. That's Dr. Jason Thistlethwaite. He's an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo in Canada. He studies the economic impacts of extreme weather and climate change. They're facing unprecedented losses associated with insurance claims. So their underwriting areas where they're trying to price risk and get collect premiums for that, their the losses are now exceeding the premiums that they're collecting. So the insurance companies are starting to reevaluate their risk and exposure that they have when climate change impacts in certain areas of the country much more than others. And of course, then the rates that they charge in that market commensurately could be cost prohibitive to, to many people who need insurance. It will be days before Florida officials know just how much damage Andrew caused there. When it got here, you didn't need an historian to tell you it was one of the biggest hurricanes of recent decades. There's already precedent for natural disasters putting insurers out of business. Before Irma hit in 2017, Hurricane Andrew was the most destructive hurricane to ever hit Florida. It caused more than $25 billion in damage. As a result, seven Florida-specific insurers and one national carrier went insolvent. This left almost a million Florida customers without coverage. It makes me sick. It's just the only thing I ever owned. I don't have anything. The U.S. government has tried to pick up the slack, but it's losing money. One example, the National Flood Insurance Program. The program allows U.S. property owners to purchase insurance protection from the government. It was meant to be an alternative to private insurance companies that didn't offer flood protection in high-risk areas, like Texas and Florida. The National Flood Insurance Program is in a lot of debt. It borrows debt from the Treasury. And this is a consequence, of course, of rates that are far too low. Uh, for the risk that a lot of people face. Congress has tried to make the program more actuarial by putting in measures to try and raise rates, and it never gets enough support because various constituencies um, throughout the U.S. oppose those rate increases, which then goes back to Congress, who then oppose the change to the National Flood Insurance Program. The insurance industry knows about the problem, but what is it doing about it? The immediate response for an insurance company will be to raise the premiums, raise the price of insurance to try and recoup those losses. 
associated with more of these natural disasters. But this isn't as easy as it sounds. After historic losses due to hurricanes Katrina, Charlie, and Ivan, insurance companies tried to drastically change their premiums in Gulf states to manage their risk. But this led to major backlash. Consumer advocacy groups tried to get new legislation introduced to reject rate changes. It's also difficult for some companies to figure out exactly how much they should charge customers. Insurance companies calculate the risk of each area by using weather data from the past 100 years to predict future extreme weather events. The challenge, of course, is that history is no longer a predictor of the future when it comes to these issues such as climate change, but also changes in development patterns and changes in the frequency of, of, of extreme weather events. So insurers are facing a challenge whereby um, a lot of their assumptions about how they price risk are being challenged by this new risk environment, forcing them to be more conservative, which largely means higher prices for property owners and businesses. Insurance companies could potentially face legal trouble if many of them decide to raise premiums at the same time. So insurers face not only sort of technical uncertainty in terms of how they go about actually figuring out this new risk environment, but also political uncertainty because if they work in unison, for instance, to recognize a higher risk environment by raising their rates, they can easily be charged with things like um, collusion and, and working together. and and be exposed to antitrust lawsuits and so on. Insurance companies tend to kind of have a herd mentality. They, if one company's doing something, they'll say, well, maybe there's something over there we should be paying attention to. Uh, so they kind of move as a group uh, as opposed to uh, uh, being individual and, and how they uh, assess their risk and make decisions. Some insurance companies have attempted to manage their losses by trying to pull out of unprofitable markets. They may run into problems with policymakers. I mean, legislators, members of Congress that are going to push back and say, listen, you can't leave these markets. The economic impact is much too devastating for you to leave these markets or to do it by fiat, by raising the rates to the point where nobody can afford it. And, and we're starting to see some of that take place. Many insurance companies found that the business in Florida, as an example, uh, just simply wasn't profitable. And what they would do is they say, well, we can't charge the rate of risk that we deem to be actuarial. And they threatened to pull out and say, we, we simply don't want to offer property insurance in the area. Uh, the Florida regulator said, well, if you are choosing not to offer property insurance, we may not let you sell any other insurance in, in the market, such as automobile insurance and so on. But there are areas where insurers are working against their own interests. While insurers are do talk quite a bit about climate, climate change, we found very little evidence that they're actually taking a lot of proactive action. When climate change started to emerge as a significant political issue in the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, environmentalists made the argument that the insurance industry could be the counterweight to the fossil fuel industry in negotiations over, over climate change. But insurance companies never blossomed into the type of lobbyists environmentalists had hoped for. Instead, a trend started of insurance companies investing in sectors that are exacerbating the problem. So insurance companies are significant investors of capital. They need to hold this capital in the event that there is a significant disaster. And oftentimes what they do with that capital is they'll invest it. And so they need to be taking a hard look at where those investments are going. Um, are they exposed to areas of commercial real estate or land or businesses in high risk areas, coastlines that are likely to flood, for instance? Are they heavily invested in greenhouse gas emission sectors? and likely to face potential reputational risk for having investments in an area of economy that's causing losses on the other side of their business. Ultimately, the growing losses due to a rise in natural disasters might be too big of a problem for insurance companies to solve on their own. A lot of what needs to happen are simply beyond the capacity of insurance companies. They're not the ones that have allowed people to develop in high-risk areas. They aren't the ones that are funding important infrastructure upgrades. The best way to keep insurance available and affordable is to have very proactive disaster risk management. And what that means is taking action and efforts before the disaster happens rather than waiting for it to happen and then focusing on the recovery. So this is a problem around the world. We have a really difficult time mitigating risk before the disaster happens. We're not proactive enough to help keep insurance available and affordable in this era of climate change. 